The list is finally here. Here are my 2019 fantasy football sleepers and busts. What's going on, fantasy football fans? I'm your host, Hussein the Brain, and you're watching the couch. If you want to see more valuable and entertaining fantasy football videos like this one, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon so you won't miss anything. With all these crazy pieces of news recently coming out, I'm kind of glad I didn't come out with my sleepers and bust video earlier when I was supposed to, and I think this list is going to be a little bit more concrete and will help you a little bit better when it comes to your draft. In order of ADP, here are my quarterback sleepers. Let's start off with Jameis Winston at 10.01 being drafted early in the 10th round. Everyone is aware of the bads that come with Jameis Winston, whether it be the crab legs or the Uber incident or jumping on a table and screaming obscenities, stuff like that we're all aware of. We're also all aware of the dumbfounding, jaw-dropping interceptions, but I think most people are aware of this, but not everybody, but his upside is really great. Remember, there was a debate between Mariota and Jameis Winston, which one's the better quarterback. You know, they were drafted one and two, and I don't think the debate's there. As far as upside goes, especially in fantasy, I think it's Jameis Winston, a gunslinger that can push the ball down the field, that's ready to take risks, that can make those huge 40-plus, 50-plus yard touchdowns. He's a guy that needs to take the check down sometimes, and what better coach than Bruce Arians to teach him this? The risk is there, but the upside is there. I'm willing to take a risk, especially when it's round 10, and keep in mind, I don't see him getting drafted round nine ever. So ADP is a measurement for mock drafts, but in real competitive leagues, he's going sometimes round 13, round 12, and sometimes he's going undrafted. So here's a guy that you can get super late and has that upside. Last year in 2018, the Bucks did lead the league in passing yards. It's a pretty crazy stat. Of course, Ryan Fitzmagic was part of that, but Jameis Winston, did have some big games. Now, can he just be more consistent? Can he not throw as many interceptions? I think that's all in the past. I think his bad behavior is all in the past. He hasn't had any incidents in a few years, but hey, I can clearly be wrong. I'm willing to take the upside for a gunslinger like Jameis Winston. And this year, quarterback is the deepest it's ever been by far. Wide receivers are deep. We'll get into that later. But they've been deep for nearly 10 years now. Maybe just above five years. Wide receivers always been deep recently. But this year, quarterback is so dang deep. I guess it becomes just a little bit more shallow now that Andrew Luck is retired, top three fantasy quarterback on just about everyone's rankings. And at 10.04, we have Kyler Murray, a quarterback that's going to slip every now and then in drafts because of that week two preseason game. And I'm not going to judge too much about what happened in the second week of preseason. I just like the ADP a little bit better. And I was able to get him at 11.11 .11 in the couch league, our draft party. And usually I would have to get him early round 11 or round 10, uh, especially when I'm drafting because you got to keep in mind everyone knows my rankings. And for some reason, uh, a lot of people like to go out of their way to quote unquote beat me or snipe me. Not so much in the in-person leagues, but especially in my subscriber leagues and, and the couch fam leagues, the Facebook group leagues. They really like to go out of their way to take my picks. I appreciate that people do pay attention to my suggestions and and do subscribe to a lot of my ideas and, and sleepers. The reason why I like Kyler Murray is similar to the reason I like Winston. I'd rather take a shot at an upside player, a player with a bit of an unknown, a bit of a risk, and I'm okay with that. I'd rather have Kyler Murray than Jared Goff. I'd rather have Kyler Murray than Phillip Rivers. Two very good quarterbacks that we know will perform well, but I have Kyler Murray projected at 640 rushing yards, might even get some rushing touchdowns, and 640 rushing yards, that's an average of four more fantasy points than Phillip Rivers, who averages 0.1 rush yards per game. Rather take a shot at someone 
younger, someone with more upside, looking to the future because I'm all about scoring a ton of points and getting them in a late ADP. I don't want a boring quarterback. Look, I can go pick up uh, Sam Darnold or Derek Carr or, uh, I mean, people ask me about Jacoby Brissett, but there's going to be quarterbacks on the waiver wire. I can go get a quarterback to start. I can get a quarterback in round 16, round 14. That's okay. Even Tom Brady is going super late. I can get a quarterback. I'm not worried. What I'm trying to do is get a quarterback late and get one with upside. My third and final quarterback sleeper is Mitch Trubisky. You can get him at the end of the draft. He's going in round 13, mid round 13, but he often goes undrafted in 12 team leagues. He went in round 13, I believe, in our 14 team Yahoo draft. I almost had him as my QB too. I drafted Matt Ryan kind of early, and then I was going for Mitchell Trubisky as a perfect QB two, and I think I missed it by one pick. I was so close to getting him and I got a bit excited on the video, but I wasn't able to get him. Mitch Trubisky has the talent. He's in the right system. Decent O-line. Matt Nagy is the truth and he'll get a lot of opportunities to score touchdowns. The upside is not so so high with Trubisky because they will not need to throw the ball a ton. Matt Nagy has a perfect balance between being aggressive and playing it smart. So he's going to teach Mitch Trubisky to throw the ball, push it down the field. The defense always has to be on their heels, never can get complacent and just be like, okay, they're just going to run the ball. That's not the type of offense with the Bears. With that being said, Coach Nagy is also trying to teach Mitch Trubisky not to make dumb mistakes, to be accurate, you know, throw the ball away when it's not there. So the upside's not going to really come with the pass yards, not a ton of pass attempts, but it will come with a little bit of rushing yards. It will come with uh, some touchdowns, some big plays. They will push the ball down the field. And Mr. Trubisky has not had a lot of experience. His first year in the NFL was basically a throwaway year with John Fox. Remember Mike Glennon was the starter. The coach got fired and he didn't really start too many games in college either so not a lot of college experience not a lot of NFL experience then we finally get a small sip a small taste of what he can do in the league and he had one big game hey is this guy the truth is this a fluke game and we saw it wasn't a fluke game but we did see the bad sides of Trubisky too he wasn't 100% comfortable in that offense which he should be this next year because the offense was great the play calling was amazing coach Nagy love you man you're, you're great you know the Bears are my second favorite team because Taylor Gabriel's on that team. 49ers, of course, are my favorite team. So I do watch the Bears quite a bit. So Trubisky has all the qualities we need in a great quarterback for the late round. More than likely will be your quarterback too, unless you're in a deep league and you can draft him as your QB1 for sure. And what the bad is with Mitch Trubisky is his consistency. If he can just be consistent from game to game, push the ball down the field efficiently, he's going to be really good and pan out as a great value pick. Like I said, he's going round 13, but often going undrafted in 12 team leagues. I'm going to have honorable mentions for every position. So these two honorable mentions for quarterback are Drew Brees and Russell Wilson. Drew Brees going in round seven, Russell Wilson going in round nine. Sleepers are really where they're going in the draft. That's really what it is. I'm not like Kyler Murray round nine is not necessarily a sleeper. Jameis Winston's ADP seems kind of high, but like I said, he's going undrafted in some leagues or you get him in round 13 a lot. That's where I see him going. Maybe in mock drafts, people draft him early or something. I don't know. Uh, but Russell Wilson, yeah, I do see him going round nine a lot. And Drew Brees, I see this man go round nine, round 10, quite often. Like I'm not like his ADP is mid round seven. I've never seen him go round five for example like it just doesn't happen I've seen him go round seven sometimes but never round five I don't even think round six so if you get Drew Brees in round nine I absolutely love that it, it all depends if he falls if he falls go get it look if you don't have a quarterback like Mahomes or maybe even Rodgers might as well wait because you can get a quarterback super late in the draft. Now, Drew Brees is going to be better. Last year, they tried to hide the holes they had on that team. And what were the holes was the third option in the pass game. They had guys like um, some guy named Carr. 
um arnold what's it dan arnold or something a tight end slash wide receiver um i can't even remember these guys names look help me out who's the wide receiver three on the saints so this year maybe ted ginn uh plays okay traquan smith is likely going to be the wide receiver too maybe he takes a step forward we know he has a lot of upside good deep threat speed player and they got jared cook who's going to be an absolute beast him and drew Brees are going to make sweet touchdown music sweet red zone music and of course you got camara which is a great wide receiver essentially and mike thomas you can't guard mike he's going to be so good he's still going to be that efficient drew Brees is probably the most accurate passer i've ever seen especially in the intermediate game defenses just can't go out and double team mike thomas anymore or you know put you know put a cornerback on camara and just shut it down okay it's over you can't do that anymore now that they have jared cook and as a bonus we might see a wide receiver two actually emerge then we have russell wilson who's being heavily undervalued that one year where he finished qb1 look i get it that's that's why he finished QB1 because there wasn't that many good quarterbacks like that's that's how it happened uh, but he's still really good he's still a great thrower of the deep ball and hopefully Metcalf can get healthy David Moore is injured so he might have a lack of wide receivers but never count this guy out it seems to never matter what's going on whether he's banged up whether the O-line sucks whether he has to run the ball himself uh, no matter what the type of plays they're calling no matter who the wide receivers are he seems to escape make big plays every year he seems to do it and opposite of Drew Brees actually Russell Wilson's ADP is round nine but I never see him fall to round 10 I just wanted to mention him you know if you do see him fall to round 10 round 11 which I never do but if that happens absolutely take him I'd be ecstatic to get him in round 10 he's usually going around round eight uh maybe even late round seven is what I'm seeing in a lot of my competitive mock drafts and real leagues and I got one bust for you guys I think it's well known I am a Cam Newton hater I do respect his talent and the man is just a beast he's a beast fullback tight end you know HB dive up the gut type of runner uh I respected his 2015 season all the way until uh, the Super Bowl when he didn't fall on that fumble. And, uh, man, he's been good. He's been good with Greg Olson. He's been good running the ball. But Cam Newton is much older now. And I know what you're saying. Like, oh, he's only 30. Like, that's not bad for a quarterback. But for a quarterback who's been taking more hits than your average running back. Like, who's got, who's got hit more, for example, Isaiah Crowell or Cam Newton? in their NFL careers. Um, it could be Cam Newton. Like, I don't know. It's just a random ruddy back that came to my head who's uh, um, not really, you know, relevant anymore in the league. So he could be taking more hits than most running backs that are playing in the league right now. And that's just not what you want from your quarterback. How is Cam Newton going to be good, right? How is he going to pan out? Like, what is, what is good about him? He's going to be good if Greg Olson can have a resurgence in his career, stay healthy, be amazing. He's going to be good if DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel pan out, if uh, Christian McCaffrey is just as good as last year. And he's really going to be good if he runs the ball and stays healthy and he is that goal line back, that secret weapon, you know, can easily average five rush yards per game and, and score those rushing touchdowns. He's never going to throw for 5,000 yards. And this is a lot to bank on. I would not bank on this with my ninth round pick. This is more of a 2015 pick. You're chasing those old stats. That's the old Cam Newton. This is what's going to likely happen. He's going to regress, not pan out, or he's going to get hurt. And I've been saying this, so it's, this is, I'm not just saying this because of the minor leg or foot injury he just suffered and was in a walking boot. He seems to be healthy from that. But I'm talking about overall man this guy's always banged up he's always getting hit and if he does start to beast keep in mind if he if he does start to be good and you're like brain brain look he's doing well don't worry the defenses will get pissed off and take cheap shots at him and i'm not condoning this i'm not like happy for this it's just the way it's gonna go defenders are not gonna be like go ahead and dab in the touchdown feel free to do that they're gonna do this we're sending a message you're not doing this again or we're going to piss you off. 
and that team will get pissed off because they will hit Cam Newton. I would rather go and get a guy like Lamar Jackson. A lot of the same things could be said about him, like the injuries is there, but here's what I think. I think Lamar Jackson's a little bit more elusive. He's going to be passing the ball a lot more. They have good coaching there on the Ravens. And on top of that, he is younger. So Lamar Jackson has taken less hits. We saw Cam get injured over and over and over again, suffered the same shoulder injury Andrew Luck did as soon as he started throwing the ball deep and his shoulder seemed healthy. Now, you know, he's got that leg foot injury. Like he's going to be banged up a lot. I'm not banking any type of season on Cam. It look in DFS. Maybe you start them, you know, you pick them once or twice, but in season long, no thank you. There's so many quarterbacks, I'm looking elsewhere. Sleeper running backs in round 10, Devin Singletary. Ooh, he's one of my favorite running backs. I'm telling you guys, I'm getting so hyped. And I get a little bit more hype because there's a couple people that disagree with this pick. I don't, I don't know why. Not too many, but a lot of people love him. And man, I absolutely love this pick. Devin Singletary is extremely talented. One reason that he fell in the draft is because he's short. He's five foot seven, and his 40 yard dash in the combine was not good, 4.66. And that's alarming. Look, there's always a red flag, and I've seen that red flag with Fournette. Fournette was supposed to be the LeBron James, but then his 40 wasn't quite where we wanted it. He didn't seem to have the acceleration and burst, and also the, the vertical, and, and just the combine, it just showed red flags. Like this guy was probably not worth a fourth overall pick in the NFL draft. And I think Darius Geis is better than Fournette. He's just a better running back. You know, it's not all about like, is this guy big, strong, and freakish? Like, it's not about that. Darius Geis was better. And if Darius Geis was completely healthy, I'd like him more. Rumor has it that Devin Singletary just kind of screwed up on the 40 and he was supposed to run it way faster on pro day, uh, but he got a little bit dinged up and he could not run it on pro day. So I think the 4.66 is a little bit deceiving. On top of that, he does have that lateral movement. So we're talking about uh, Shady McCoy here with a little bit more attitude. And guess who's on that team is Shady McCoy, who's overpaid, uh, over the hill, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he's just taking a hit on that cap space and just had a horrible year last year. He was a complete bust. And another running back on that Buffalo Bills totem pole is Frank Gore, who's 36 years old towards the end of his career. So I think Singletary has a really good shot at, at just grasping that starting role. And it could be as early as week three, week one, week four. We don't know. I'm willing to take the risk. One trade that might happen, Jadavion Clowney might go to the Bills. And I would love that because... Uh, I have the Bills defense in a couple leagues, so that would be amazing if Jadavion Clowney goes to the Bills and maybe Shady gets traded back to uh, the Texans who are in desperate need of a running back. That could happen. I see the Bills having to give up maybe a second round pick and Shady, something like that. Maybe a wide receiver and Jadavion and, and a pick um, because I, I don't think you're going to give up Jadavion for that cheap. Who knows? This this could be great. And there could be a lot of things. Uh, Shady could get traded. Shady could get cut because of cap space. Um, Frank Gore is old. There, there's going to be so many ways that Devin Singletary can rise up. And you can get him in, in leagues where some people are just aren't up on rookies and just don't do a lot of research. Devin Singletary can easily go in round 11. And man, if, he, if he's there at round 11, you absolutely have to draft him. I think my biggest sleeper is Alexander Madison going at the end of round 11. So he's basically going undrafted. Every league I do, he goes drafted. He goes uh, undrafted actually in 10 team leagues. And this is a guy you have to target, especially if you have Dalvin Cook. It's a no-brainer. I know handcuffs usually don't pan out, but what's the harm in taking Alexander Madison in round 11? There's two scenarios that I see realistically for Madison. One, Dalvin Cook, who hasn't really played much in the NFL because he can't stay healthy, gets hurt again. Boom, Alexander Madison is a top 15 running back. That's pretty much an RB1, must start every week automatically that's the that's one of the realistic scenarios the second realistic scenario is that dalvin cook is limited um they, they preserve him because the vikings are not trying to win eight games 
They're thinking Super Bowl, they're thinking playoffs. And with a guy like Dalvin Cook, who's always hurt, why not preserve him? Why not hold him to 17 to 19 touches and give Madison 7 to 9 touches? Everyone's talking about the Vikings will run the ball a lot, and that's not exactly how I put it. I'll put it like this. The running back position will be utilized heavily on the Vikings offense. That's going to be the philosophy, whether it's a short throw to the running back, um, up the gut run, like the running back will be used a lot. And this should help out the team. It should help out the defense. That's all good. But it doesn't mean that Dalvin Cook's going to run the ball 20 times. Alexander Madison could be stealing some snaps, could be stealing some uh, rushing attempts, some uh, targets, and even some goal line work possibly to preserve Dalvin Cook. This scenario number two, I think, is more realistic. And for a backup running back who doesn't have much uh, competition there. I really do see Alexander Madison as the solidified number two running back because Latavius Murray is gone. I think it's a great pick. He's absolutely slept on. And the reason he slept on, because of his name. He doesn't have a big name. He's just not the sexy pick. And here's the sexy pick though, and that's Justice Hill going in round 12. He can catch the ball. He has the home run threat. He is super fast. And I like how he runs too. Being on the Ravens, they should run the ball a lot. Gus Edwards is pretty underrated and is a good running back, but the starting running back is Mark Ingram. And that man usually doesn't play 16 games. He hasn't had the best health. So if he goes down, down or he's not performing well, Justice Hill is going to get a lot more carries, a lot more snaps. And then he does have to compete with Gus Edwards. Like I said, Gus Edwards is super talented. He is a really good runner, but he can't catch the ball. And so that's why I see Justice Hill getting a lot of run. He's definitely a stash. Look, going in round 12, you're not going to start him, but let's see what happens. He has the upside. Is this something happens to Mark Ingram or he just performs extremely well? He can just ball out, and by that time, hopefully, the bye weeks are coming. It's week four, five, six, seven, eight, or even 11 when those bye weeks are really hitting, and maybe Justice Hill or Devin Singletary is just exploded by then. My last sleeper is Chase Edmonds, one of the ultimate handcuffs. He will have just a little bit of standalone value, not one that you want to start, but look, he's going completely undrafted in 12 team leagues. He's going like round 18. He's even going undrafted drafted in 14 team leagues um, in 16 team leagues he'll probably get drafted for sure but if you draft david johnson might as well go get chase edmonds round 16 i don't see how this is that bad of a deal look chase edmonds is cool you can disagree with me that's fine get him i'm telling you and then you can drop him week four you can drop him week three if there's a hot waiver wire pickup you can drop him week one a lot of times and nobody will really tell you this, but a lot of times having a player that you can drop without taking a toll on your conscience is amazing. Taking a super big flyer on a player that you know could easily be a bust and you can drop like that is great. Drafting Larry Fitzgerald last year is what hurts teams where you're like, I can't drop this guy. I can't drop him. What do I do? I can't drop him. I can't start him. Like, you're in limbo. That That's what takes your team now. I feel like when you do that, your team gets like worse and worse and worse just a little bit every week and just keeps dragging you down, dragging you down. And Chase Edmonds, he's a handcuff. He'll be involved in the offense a little bit. And one reason I'm saying he'll be uh, involved in the offense, not just because of reports of Chase Edmonds having a role, but because of the wide receivers. They will be running a lot of four wide receiver sets. That's what we expect. And it's a lot of rookie wide receivers and Christian Kirk, uh, second year, first year with Kyler Murray. So there's a lot of inexperience at the receiver position. And David Johnson should be running a lot of wide receiver routes, could even play the slot. Maybe Chase Edmonds does that. So we're going to be seeing a lot of two running back sets too. I mean, it's really going to be probably four wide receivers and one of these two running backs, DJ or Edmonds, will be playing wide receiver on certain plays. And of course, everyone plays PPR nowadays, DJ and Chase Edmonds are both great in PPR. Edmonds can catch the ball. I have a lot of honorable mentions, so I'll go through them super quick. Joe Mixon is a top seven running back. He's going in round two. If he falls around two, I'd pretty much have to take him 99% of the time. Royce Freeman, I'd rather get him round eight or nine. He's going round nine in ADP. I'd even take him at the end of round seven. Rather get Royce 
in round nine than Lindsay in round three or four. They should be splitting 50-50. And look, even if it's 60-40, I'd still rather get Royce later. Super good value. Jalen Samuels going in round 10, basically. Really good in PPR. Similar situation to what I was talking about with Chase Edmonds. He'll have standalone value. He's not just a handcuff. And he should be playing in the slot or doing some kind of wide receiver or receiver roles. Uh, he can catch the ball. Super good in PPR. Great value. Sometimes he falls to round 11. That's when you take them. Then we have Tony Pollard and Justin Jackson. Not two players I recommend taking in every single league. Like if you're in 10 leagues, you may want them in about three. But Tony Pollard has some standalone value. A little bit and should get a huge, huge boost if Zeke were to miss any games due to holdout or any other reason. Um, I mean, he is on TMZ every now and then and doing other things. But other than that, I mean, Zeke has been uh, extremely durable, which is a rare quality to find in... Uh, workhorse running backs and then we have Justin Jackson who actually does not have a lot of standalone value if Melvin Gordon stops holding out and plays for the Chargers so a little bit different here but he gets a huge boost and has a ton of upside if Melvin Gordon were to hold out were to get injured or get traded and running backs do go down often the most injury prone position just these are just facts just statistics is the running back and i mean everyone knows that they get hit a lot they put their bodies through so much running backs get hurt all the time and we just saw lamar miller get hurt man maybe they trade for melvin gordon i don't see that happening but he could get traded like it definitely could happen every year a team has like their running back one and running back two go down kind of funny that's kind of what happened to the texans in a weird way because they cut their running back two and then the running back one did go down now they do have duke johnson i don't know i don't know maybe they'll trade maybe they'll sign a jay i don't know by maybe by the time this video goes up this some deal will already be done who knows I just like Justin Jackson, and in some leagues, they are forgotten. Keep in mind, a lot of owners are drafting on ESPN or Yahoo, and some of these platforms have these guys ranked like 2,843. Yes, I'm talking to you. I don't want to name any names, but uh, I think you know who you are. Fix your rankings, please. Now, the most unsexiest sleeper uh, honorable mention is Dion Lewis at 13.01. I don't know what it is. Why do we hate him so much? I don't get it. It's definitely not sexy. Definitely not a ton of upside if Henry is healthy. I mean, he's hurt right now, right? But uh, you know, he should be healthy by week one. But still, if you're in a full PPR league, Deion Lewis does have standalone value. When the tight ends are behind in games, Deion Lewis gets a boost because Derrick Henry's not much of a pass catcher. If something were to happen to Derrick Henry, Deion Lewis gets a huge boost and you can get him in round 14. This is really why I like him. So if you only have like three running backs on your team and you know you couldn't get a lot of upside or you only have four running backs, Deion Lewis, although very unsexy, not a ton of upside, could be a safe PPR running back to target in like round 14. And look, his ADP says early round 13. I get that, but he's so unsexy that he could easily fall and even go undrafted, believe it or not, in 12-team leagues. Now, very interesting one here that I want to talk about is uh, ADP 13.04, Damian Harris. Now, I've been going back and forth with this. I've always liked Harris, and I even drafted James White in, in a PPR league a long time ago. Guys, don't draft early. <laughs> and I, I kind of regret that because Michelle, he's always been a good pass catcher and a, and a guy has that home run threat, and he's been a really good runner in the NFL. Uh, he just didn't catch any passes last year on the Patriots. I have a theory. Bill Belichick is a genius. I'm telling all these fantasy owners, look, if you have Michelle, I don't, I don't like Michelle, but if you have him, he should ball out. He should be good. Trade him in three weeks, max four weeks. If he streams together three good games, trade him away. Somebody will take him. He's got bad knees. Why wouldn't Belichick do this? Now, I don't know if Belichick would trade him next year which is more likely scenario, but he could do the same thing this year. He builds up Michelle. Michelle's catching passes, um, breaking tackles, you know, averaging seven uh, rush yards per game, which is very doable if they can get that O-line uh, situation fixed on the Patriots. He is really good. One of my favorite running backs coming out of college just as a fan, but the knees concern me. Why wouldn't Belichick trade him away? They have Rex Burkhead, who would be a good 
you know, third string running back. They have James White, great pass catching running back. And they have Damian Harris, who's decent. I don't know if, uh, how much Bill Belichick likes him now. Maybe, like I said, he needs to develop him. And maybe the Patriots don't really play Damian Harris this year, but then they feature him next year. I don't know. But the situation is there to where Sony Michelle gets traded or gets injured. And that's why I do like Damian Harris. He is going in round 13. So super late, good flyer to have. And hey, I mean, if I'm totally wrong, like I said, it's just a theory, more like a conspiracy theory. If I'm totally wrong, I think you can go ahead and drop him. You won't have like this heavy conscious, like, oh my God, I have to drop my RB6. Whatever do I do? It's okay. I mean, some people have Damien Harris as their RB8 or RB7. And then at the end of the draft, we have Ty Montgomery, who should be the RB2 for the Jets. Just someone I wanted to mention if you are a Le'Veon Bell owner or in a deep league, it's a bit of a sleeper to get. In a 12 team league, you don't really need to get Ty Montgomery. You don't even need to get him as a handcuff. But if you're in a super deep league, like 16 team or deeper, Ty Montgomery might get slept on and getting the handcuff to Le'Veon Bell who's on a new team and hasn't played football in over a year could be a good idea like I said 12 team pretty much forget about it RB busts players I'm avoiding James Conner is going at the end of round one I don't like it He's just not that talented. We're all James Conner fans, as in, like, we root for the guy. We were kind of happy to see him ball out last year. But he's just really not that good. He's got good soft hands, but can't really run wide receiver routes. I think Jalen Samuels is going to get featured a lot. James Conner, to me, is a third rounder. But he's going as a top 15 running back. I would avoid him. Todd Gurley, super talented. One of my favorite running backs in the league if he were to be healthy. All these reports with Sean McVay. Why are you still believing Sean McVay? Hasn't the man lied to us 100% of the time? Oh, he's healthy. He's going to do good. He's going to be heavily featured in the Super Bowl. This and that. The man's lied. CJ Anderson was the running back in the playoffs. It wasn't Todd Gurley. And with arthritis, people people tell me, oh, you can live a nice, healthy life with arthritis. Sure, but I bet, I'm not a doctor, but I bet your doctor, if he asked your occupation and is getting tackled by 260-pound world-class athletes and hitting your knee, probably tell you to change occupations. The Rams, let's just say, are regretting that deal they gave Todd Gurley, making him the highest paid running back. I'm avoiding him. Look, you can go ahead and draft him, and if you do, handcuff him with Daryl Henderson, please. There's two scenarios I see with Todd Gurley. He'll be limited, or he'll get hurt again, and I, I just don't see a third case scenario. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't draft him. And people do the math like this. Okay, so he's gonna get 70% of the snaps he did last year, which is probably gonna happen. He's not. It just doesn't translate to exactly 70%. Uh, fantasy points that's you know theoretically sure but it quite doesn't maybe they rest them more when they have a lead maybe they go with another running back maybe they only feature him in certain scenarios like you just don't know how it's going to pan out too many question marks too many red flags I'm avoiding Gurley. I recommend you do as well. Then we have Devontae Freeman and this is a weird one because he's going so late if he's there in round four Go ahead and take him. But in round three, for a player that's diminutive, has suffered seven injuries in the past two years, this might be a player to just avoid. I smell a committee. And just like I've been saying with uh, Dalvin Cook and Gurley, he's either going to get hurt this year or he's going to get limited or both. Avoid Freeman in the first three rounds. Then we have Kareem Hunt, who I like if you have a deep bench and you can stash him or you can have him as a handcuff to Chubb. That's cool, but if for Alexander Madison to be going in round 12 and Kareem Hunt to be going mid-round 8 is just stupid. Like, it doesn't make any sense especially if you have less than seven bench spots. When those bye weeks hit, you're going to be regretting having Kareem Hunt. Kareem Hunt hasn't played a game in a year. He's going to come back week 10, going to be eased in, not going to be doing much till maybe week 12. So you're going to roster a guy for 12 weeks and not start him? That's just crazy. But hey, if you're in a deep league, if he falls and you have Chubb, I do see the potential in getting him. I just had to put him on my bus list because his ADP is way too high. And this could partially be because of how the platforms rank them. If you're playing in, 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 a, in a league and you see the ranking, you know, Kareem Hunt sitting at the top of the rankings during round seven, round eight, round nine, someone's sure to take him. 
Hey, I don't know, man. Just I can't get Hunt in round eight just because he's a name. Like everyone knows him, and no one knows who Alexander Madison is. You're going to be disappointed in me. I'll tell you this. I don't have any wide receiver sleepers. I don't want to force it. I do have a bunch of honorable mentions and guys I'll talk about. But I'm not going to force it because there's so many wide receivers to pick from. There's good value ones. And that goes to my point. Like, you can wait. I love drafting a top seven, top nine wide receiver, but don't draft. I don't need to draft two of them though. Like you can get an elite one. That's cool. And then you can also wait all the way to round six to draft your wide receiver too. Cause I just don't care. I feel like if you throw five darts at the wide receiver draft board, you can easily hit on three of them. And these are some honorable mentions that you can hit on. Allen Robinson in round seven. I was off him last year when everyone's everyone, everyone's writing top 15 wide receiver, top 15. 15 wide receiver. Well, this year you can pay a top 30 wide receiver price and he can actually pan out as a wide receiver too. Absolutely love this pick. We saw that Trubisky was throwing to him in the second half of the season. He actually became a wide receiver one on that team. There was a true wide receiver one and that was A-Rob. Now he is a little bit more removed in time from those injuries he suffered. He should be fully healthy. Absolutely love this pick. And I talked about Trubisky a lot, you know, second year in this on this team, second year on this offense for A-Rob. Should be good pick. Then we have D.D. Westbrook, who I hate, who was actually a true sleeper, not an honorable mention, because I was getting him in round 9, 10, and 11. Now you got to get him in round 6. It's just, it pisses me off. But you got Nick Foles, who's a decent quarterback, and then you have his number one target. And, and when I say target, I mean that's number one receiver, not just wide receiver. They don't have great tight ends. They don't have great pass catching backs. It's definitely going to be just the number one guy is going to be Westbrook. And there's not a ton of competition behind him when it comes to targets, when it comes to wide receivers. D.D. Westbrook is at the top of the Jaguars receiving totem pole. Man, I need more stock in Westbrook, but uh, I hate paying for a round six. He's almost worth a round six price, though. That's how much I like him. I uh, just wish I was able to get him round eight, round nine more of the time, but I think the cat's out the bag, though. Then we have Sterling Shepard, who... I guess you could say it was a little bit more disappointing and we saw Ingram do well his rookie year, but times have changed a lot for the Giants. The Giants are a completely new team. They drafted Saquon just one year ago. I know Saquon, for some reason, doesn't he seem like a pro, like like a veteran, like he's been playing for four, five, six years, his attitude and the way he plays. like. It's hard to believe Saquon's only been in the league one year. That team has changed a lot. They drafted a quarterback. They got rid of Odell. They drafted Saquon Barkley number two overall last year. It's a different team. And Sterling Shepard has always been talented. Now, can he get more targets? I think so. There's definitely a risk there because the team may not be that good. Maybe Ingram does get a ton of targets and Saquon does. But getting him in round eight, he's being slept on. And, and think about it. He was going round six and seven a, a lot of times. But now you can get him round nine because he broke his hand. By the way, he's practicing. He should be a full go. Should be fully healthy week one, which is a bonus. But I don't even really need that because sometimes you can get him as your wide receiver four and don't even need to start him. That's how late he's going. So I like Sterling Shepard, hoping he can get some targets. We can throw another dart at the wide receiver board with MVS. I like him over Geronimo. MVS should be the number two wide receiver, the number two most targeted player on the Packers. There is some risk there because of his drops, but in two wide receiver sets, it should be MVS and Geronimo should take the slot. And then we have DK Metcalf because of his injury. He's dropping. There's just not a lot of competition in that wide receiver room. Metcalf is going to probably have to start uh, sooner than later. David Moore is injured. Um, no Doug Baldwin, like, I don't see how you don't play Metcalf. Then we have Michael Gallup uh, being drafted in round 11. Devontae Parker. The chance that Devontae Parker is a complete bust, 78.9%. <laughs> and that's okay because his ADP is calculated in that. He's going undrafted in 12 team leagues. Going undrafted in 14 team leagues. So being able to pick him up off free agency and being able to drop him the next day is a good feeling. Maybe he revives his career. And what does that leave? About a 20% chance he revives his career with Fitzmagic and makes some big plays. Kenny Stills, I hear, is on the bubble. I don't know what's going on. I just know that they don't have a lot of good wide receivers there. They're going to probably need to throw the ball and play catch up. 
Let's see. I'll, I'll take a flyer on Devontae Parker. Also take a flyer on Traquan Smith. Maybe he's the wide receiver too on the Saints. The wide receiver too they've been looking for. And then my favorite flyer is Jalen Hurd who's going undrafted in 14 team leagues. This is a complete flyer. Another guy you can drop right away. I think he's super talented. Can play running back. Can play wide receiver. He's tall. He can do it all. And he's just growing on me man. And I just don't see how the Niners don't start Dante Pettis. Don't start Jalen Hurd and don't start Debo Samuels. They got to start those three wide receivers. And Hurd can do it. I absolutely love him. Get him at the end of, uh, of your draft or pick him up off free agency. He's also a guy that you may have to drop week one or week four. And I'm totally fine with that. I love those players where you can just drop. Another player that's going completely undrafted is Trey Quinn. Look, this team sucks, Washington. This team is cursed. The quarterback situation is a little weird. I only know one wide receiver that's starting, and that's going to be Trey Quinn in the slot. Could be good in PPR. Yeah, that's really all I got to say about him. Uh, going undrafted in 12-team leagues. A good late-round pick in deeper leagues. And for bust, I don't even really have any bust, but uh, I already talked about these guys. Geronimo's going at one round earlier than MVS. Not really big on many Packer receivers other than Adams, but I am big on Rodgers. So just that chance that there is a wide receiver too that's decent is, is worth it. So I'd just rather get MVS around later than uh, Geronimo. Dante Pettis is going in the round seven. I like him in round nine, but I would not draft him in round eight, round seven. I was... At first, kind of avoiding all Niners wide receivers, but if I can get Debo Samuels in, in round 12 or something like that, or if I can get Jalen Hurd off uh, free agency, I like those type of flyers. Dante Pettis would not draft him in the first eight rounds. For tight ends, at 7.01 ADP, we have Jared Cook. Drew Brees is going to love him. Jared Cook's going to love Drew Brees. He's finally got a good team, good quarterback, should stay healthy. You know, when he had Aaron Rodgers, he wasn't healthy that year, and it was just a one-year thing. I think he's going to have a really good year, man. He's going to really help this Saints team out. We talked enough about the Saints, though. At 8.09, we have David Njoku, and the reason why I'm adamant on putting him on my sleepers list is because he often falls to round nine. I'd be happy taking him at 8.09. I have him as a top nine time. Tight end. Matter of fact, top seven tight end ahead of Evan Ingram and ahead of Vance McDonald. And the worry here with Njoku that people tell me is that there's just not enough balls to go around. And this is not a PPR target type of tight end. There will be enough touchdowns to go around. There'll be enough efficiency. There'll be enough moving the ball. When I go for tight ends, I am looking for touchdowns. And Njoku can give me double digit touchdowns. He's not going to give me 1,000 yards. You just cannot expect that anywhere near that from Njoku. But if he can move the ball on third downs, if he can find that soft zone, defenses are going to be worried about Odell and Nick Chubb and also Jarvis. So Njoku is always going to be a mismatch no matter who's guarding him. Like He's not going to get double teamed or anything like that. He'll have a lot of good looks. There'll be play designs where he's wide open. It will happen. David Njoku could be very similar to what Ebron was last year. 10 touchdowns, 11 touchdowns, 13 touchdowns. Very likely scenario for Njoku. Then we have TJ Hawkinson, who's not the starting tight end. So I don't know, Is that does that make Jesse James the starting tight end? I don't know. TJ Hawkinson is extremely talented. He can catch, he can block. Uh, I mean, who else this team is going to put out there? Like, they got to put this man in there. He's so talented. And his stock is dropping just a little bit because of news that he's not the starting tight end. I still love to take him. The problem is, is you just cannot have him as your tight end one. You can't have a rookie who's, you know, not going to start, quote unquote, uh, as your tight end one. You can't do it, but love him as my tight end two if he falls around 11, 12, sometimes 13. Like, look, that's that's late. That's basically round 12 in a 12-teamer. I'll take him there. And then we have Mark Andrews. This is a weird one because, look, TJ Hawkins is never going in round seven, right? But Mark Andrews, I've seen him go in round seven, round eight, round nine. I've seen him go in round 16. 
So this guy's going all over the place. Hopefully he falls to you. In a 10-team league, you don't want him as your tight end one. In a 12-team league, if the rest of your team is balling, you have a good quarterback, good running backs, good wide receivers, Mark Andrews as your tight end one is acceptable. Now, if you're in a 16-team league, I love Mark Andrews as a tight end one. Just take that flyer, a little bit of risk, but was a super sleeper in the throne followers versus followers league. We got him in round 16 to back up George Kittle. And I'm not dropping him. I might trade him, but I'm not dropping him. He's far too valuable, has way too much upside, especially on a team like the Ravens. That'll probably run a lot of two tight end sets. We'll probably throw to the tight end a lot. And that tight end is going to be Mark Andrews. And we have Dallas Godard, who I was very shocked by his ADP, goes undrafted. So essentially he's going in round 18 in a 12 team league and we all know most drafts don't go that far. They go to 16 rounds. Get Dallas Goder. If Ertz were to go down, Dallas Goder is a top five, I think top three tight end. When Ertz went down a few years ago, we saw Trey Burden become a must start and the same could happen with Goder. Now Goder does have some standalone value, kind of like a Chase Edmonds or Madison, how I was talking about that. Not one you, you don't want to start him week one or anything crazy like that but as your tight end too you can get him off free agency you can get him in round 14 16 I do like it the only real knock I have with doing something like that is if you have five bench spots or fewer you don't really have room for Dallas Goddard I'd rather go get a running back or something like that Unfortunately, that's why I recommend playing in leagues with seven bench spots. Some honorable mentions, Chris Herndon should be really good when he returns from that four-game suspension. Bit of a wild card, don't know what's going to happen, but in the land of crapshoot tight ends, getting Chris Herndon at the end of your draft as your tight end two, which you don't have to start because bye weeks don't even hit till week four, you could be able to get Chris Herndon. Unfortunately, Kittle's bye week is week four. And so if you do have a tight end like Kittle, Chris Herndon will be suspended week four. So that sucks, but there's not that many teams on bye for week four. So any other bye week, you know, week five and beyond, uh, Chris Herndon should be uh, back and no one's drafting him as a tight end one anyway. Then we have Will Disley and Ian Thomas, not telling you to draft them in any redraft leagues, but in Dynasty, these two guys, I'm really keeping an eye on and seeing what they can do. Only a tight end in the way of Ian Thomas is Greg Olson, and he's one injury away from becoming the next Jason Witten crappy commentator. And then Will Disley, he put on a clinic for like two games, <laughs> not really clinic, but he was really good. Like he could, he could have been tight end one last year if he stayed healthy, but he got injured really soon. And in Seattle, they're talking about sharing the workload at tight end. So Nick Van Nett, Will Disley, and and maybe a third tight end might get involved in there. So that's the talk. But from what I've seen. Will Disley's um, far more talented than any of them. And my bust is, is just not a good one. It's not good. What can I tell you? It's Eric Ebron. His stock will fall. His ADP will fall. But here's the thing. I had Eric Ebron as my bust. And you can check. I go on other people's podcasts. I've said it before on live streams. Eric Ebron's a bust. And now that Andrew Lux retired... Eric Ebron is undraftable. Don't even take him. It's completely stupid. I don't know if people are still taking him. His ADP says round eight here, but like I said, I'm sure it'll drop down to, I don't know, round nine, 10, 11. I don't know. I don't know what people think. People are obsessed with Jacoby Brissett and, and they still think that the Colts are going to be good. That's what some people are telling me. I disagree. I think Jack Doyle's stock remains relatively the same. But everyone else takes a hit. And what kind of video would this be on Fantasy Couch without a little bit of defense and kickers? Unfortunately, I don't have too much, but I will mention just a little bit. I love the Cowboys D as a sleeper because of the first three weeks. I'm all for streaming defenses and not reaching for them. Only defense I would consider reaching for in round 12 maybe would be the Bears D. Other than that, I'm drafting a defense with my last two picks. I like the Bills D because the Cowboys D is going to rely on Zeke. So if Zeke Zeke's back week one. Love the Cowboys D. They're talented. They're good. They're not in a ton of shootouts, which is really good. So they should be safe. But I really like the Bills D here. They got the cornerbacks. They got Ed Oliver. They're rumored to be interested in Jadavion Clowney. And if that trade were to happen, oh my, this defense will just go through the roof. 
So they have no holes on defense. I like them. And they're they're young. Uh, I mean, they're they're not the best defense, but look at who they're playing the first three weeks. They're in the same division as the Dolphins. That's a big plus. So Cowboys and Bills, they both have sweet matchups the first three weeks. And hey, man, I'm drafting the Bills in all my leagues in the second to last round. I love it. Uh, you can get them off free agency. Assuming the Jags and Ravens are taken, I might go for the Bills. And for kickers, just keep tabs on who the Browns kicker is going to be. They're having a bit of a competition now. Keep tabs on who the Bears kicker is going to be. It's probably going to be Eddie Pinheiro. I Hopefully I pronounced that right. So I like those two kickers. You can get them at the very last pick of the draft. And Josh Lambeau, good kicker in super deep leagues. Don't want to draft him in a 12-team league, but if you're in a 16-team league or a 20-team league... And yes, there are 20 team leagues. I will be live streaming one September 3rd, I believe, Tuesday. I will be a 20 team live stream on this YouTube channel if that uh, date and time doesn't change. Should be 8 p.m. Eastern, I think, Tuesday, September 3rd. So yes, they do exist and I will do them here. That's a lot of fun, by the way. Make sure you do check out that live stream. Also, guys, make sure you like this video, dislike it if you didn't like it, subscribe to this YouTube channel, just hit that white couch icon here. We also have a second YouTube channel, Fantasy Couch Podcast. Subscribe to that as well. Who are your sleepers and busts? Comment below. Let me know and I'll catch you on the next live stream, video, or podcast.